I want to pose a riddle to you, just like when we read the book of Judges in the story of Samson, as he was attracted by a Philistine woman in Timnah, and he went down there, and he was having wedding feast, and there were about 30 companions came to celebrate the occasion. So he said, let me pose a riddle to you. And if you give me an answer to this riddle, I will give you 30 changes of clothing. So what was the riddle? And he said, out of the eater came something to eat. And out of strong came something to be sweet. What was the answer? Where's the sua? What was the answer to the, this reader? If anyone remembers. Okay, someone is searching the Bible. It was a dead lion. A honey was coming out of dead lion. Because once, as he was going down to the Philistine, he saw a young lion. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he was able to kill by bare hands young lion. And then a few days later, he was walking down the same street, and he saw that dead corpse, dead lion. But out of his dead corpse, there was honey, and he took the honey and gave it to his father and without telling him what was happened. That was the riddle and the answer. Now, this morning, as we are celebrating the last Sunday of the year 2019, let me pose you a reader as well. Are you ready? If you get an answer to, right answer to this reader, I will give uh, Sally's iPad. <laughs> Out of the dead gives life. What is the answer? Something that is dead but gives you life. Jesus, of course. The answer is always Jesus. He was a crucified on the cross, but his death gave us eternal life. Yes, that is right, but today, as we've been reading the Bible, especially in the Second Kings, and particularly in the story of Elisha, as he received a double portion of anointing, that rested it upon his master, Eliza. That was his desire. That was his prayer. And God granted that desire throughout his ministry, throughout his life. As Eliza performed eight miracles, Eliza exactly performed 16 miracles. Exactly the double, but not so. He was able to perform, by the grace of God, 15 miracles, but he died. But God was continually faithful and granted his desire, even after Elisha died. There was one occasion, Moabites invaded the land. And at the time, there were certain people who were carrying dead body of certain men. And but because there was a raid and there was Moabite army attacking the land and fleeing from them, and they accidentally put this dead corpse inside Elisha's tomb. And this dead body touched the dead bones of Elisha. And this man came alive. This man revived and stood up. And by doing this miracle, God fulfilled exactly 16 miracles and double portion of an anointing Elisha so desired. From this story, there's a great spiritual lesson for you and I. That's something we are going to expound today. What this story entails and gives us a sp spiritual lesson to us, Elisha's dead bone will give another man, another dead man, life back to him. So let's turn our Bible to 2 Kings chapter 13 from verse 20 through 25. We will alternate. 2 Kings chapter 13 verse 20 through 25. Then Elisha 
died and they buried him. And the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. So it was, as they were burying a man, that suddenly they spied a band of raiders, and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. And Hazel, the king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Joaz. But the Lord was gracious to them, had compassion on them, and regarded them, because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not yet destroy them or cast them from his presence. Now Isaiah, king of Israel, Syria, died. Then Ben-Hadad, his son, reigned in his place. And Jehoash, the son, son of Jehoaz, recaptured, recaptured from, from the hand of Ben-Hadad, ben -Hadad, the son of Hazael, the, the cities which he had, he had taken out of the hand of Jehoaz, his father by war. Three times Jehoash defeated him and recaptured the cities of Israel. As we've been reading the kings, we realize that the land of Israel was divided into half. The northern part of Israel became Israel. We call that nation Israel. But the southern kingdom of Israel, we call that Judah. And in the land of Judah, we will have kings who are righteous, sometimes evil kings. But in the northern kingdom of Israel, all the kings, starting with Jeroboam, will be evil in the sight of the Lord. And during the time of Elisha, also the kings were evil as well. The kings were like Joash and Joaz. Both kings were evil in the sight of the Lord. But the Lord was gracious. Lord had a mercy upon God's people, and God will bring about victory when evil kings will engage into the words. And God will also have a prophets like Eliza and Elisha. And through them, God will reveal his provision. And through them, God will show his power through the miracles. And God will speak to his people in his grace. So through the life of Elisha, God revealed how faithful he was, how powerful he was, how merciful he was. And continually, even though the nation was under the evil king, and through righteous and obedient servants of God and by the prophets, God will continually begin to speak to his people. Now, Elisha, as we know, the famous story in the chapter, second chapter of Second Kings, he had a great desire. He was a servant to his master. He was being obedient to his master, Eliza, all his life. He is pouring water into his cave, meaning that he was a faithful servant to Eliza. And also he was one of the student prophets. Eliza will train students of prophets in various schools. And Elisha was one of the prophets under the leadership of Elisha. However, he had an extraordinary desire. He knew God was using Elisha powerfully because of anointing that rested it upon Elisha. So by the time God was taking Elisha by the whirlwind of chariot of fire, that Elisha will not give up following Eliza, asking him, I desire a double portion of anointing that has been resting upon you. And Eliza said that that's a difficult request. However, God seemed to grant that desire. So throughout the ministry of Eliza, after Eliza was gone, that he performed almost double as twice miracles that Eliza performed but only 15 miracles that he was able to perform. A little bit short of double portion of anointing. But as we read this story, after Elisha was dead, there was another miracle, fulfilling 16th miracle. So exactly he received double portion of anointing from his own master, Elisha. From this story, there are lessons that we can take. There are lessons we can embrace in our life. The first lesson 
is again, our God is faithful God. Our God is so faithful. He will always keep his promises. He will carry out his promises no matter what kind of circumstances we may go through. People come and go. People live and die. Circumstances are blocking often, and circumstances seem to be hopeless. But our God is alive. Our God lives forever. And no matter what kind of circumstances we may go through, God will be always, always faithful. Once he makes a covenant, once he speaks a promise, no matter what, dead or alive, he will keep and carry out his promises. So from this story, Elisa is already dead. So we can think, oh, he performed the 15 miracles. A little bit short of double portion of anointing. That's okay. We'll be satisfied with the 15 miracles. Good job, Elisha. But not so much. Not so quite yet when people thought that was the end of story of Elisha. He was an amazing man of God. He performed the miracle, 15 miracles. We are content. That's okay. Not quite yet. God's story does not end there. When people thought he's dead, no longer he can perform miracle. Perhaps Elisha even pondered at his deathbed. God, I desired a double portion. God, I prayed for a double portion of anointing. You used me to perform 15 miracles. Now I am about to die. But I wonder, God, I'm okay. I'm thankful for 15 miracles that you performed in my life. However, I ask you for double portion, then where is the 16th miracle? God, you are taking me home. Maybe perhaps Elisha pondered about 16th miracle, and he may have been content, or he may have been questioning God at his deathbed, but he died. He died. But to our amazement, even though Elisha died, God still will grant the desire and prayer of Elisha by performing this miracle. Using dead bones of Elisha, God will bring another dead man back to life. And that is a such, such amazing story to encourage us and to again hope in God, believing our God is a faithful, dead or alive, he will fulfill his promises. Even after our death, he will still answer our prayers. You see, Eliza, Eliza's master, raised one dead boy up. As we know the story, there was a particular widow in a city in a town called Zarephath. And this widow, by the miracles of Eliza, she was able to be provi provided. But she had a son, and this son died suddenly, and Eliza was able to raise the, the, this dead boy up. Just like his master, Eliza, also was ministered by women of Sunam. Sunamite women was providing this Eliza and providing lodging for him for some time as well. But this Women was married to men, but they didn't have a child. She was a barren. So Elisha asked her, what is your desire? You've been faithfully serving me, and I want to grant your desire. And she said, I don't have a child. And Elisha prayed to God, and she happened to have a son. This son grew up well. At a certain point, suddenly this son said, Oh, my head, my head, I have an awful headache. And then he died. And Elisha, by the grace and power of God, laid his own body upon the dead boy. And this boy came back to life. So, miracle of raising that person up, back to life, one-on-one, matching with his master. But Elisha, Ask God for double portion. And God 
faithfully answered his prayer, even after Elisha was gone. And there was a particular dead man happened to be gushed into the tomb of Elisha. And as soon as this dead man's body touched the dead bones of Elisha, he revived. He came back to life and stood. And from this story, we are so amazed by God's faithfulness. Whether dead or alive, no matter what kind of circumstances we may be in, God always keeps his promises. We are concluding year 2019. All of us offered certain prayers unto God. And as we end this year, some of us may be hopeless. Some of us may be discouraged. I pray to God consistently throughout this year, but God has not answered my prayers. God has not granted desires of my heart. However, we may bury year 2019, but God can answer still in year 2020. Because God can answer prayers after we are even gone, dead or alive, closed or open doors, no matter what kind of circumstances we may be in, God, His faithfulness endures forever and ever. And His faithfulness overrides any kind of circumstances. We know a famous man, his name is George Muller. He's known for receiving over 10,000 answers to his prayers. In November 1844, he decided to pray for five unsaved souls. Two of them were sons of his friend. And he decided to pray every day for the salvation of five people. After 18 months of praying every day, whether he was sick or not, whether he was so busy with his ministry, taking care of orphans, he always, always prayed for five people for their salvation. Eighteen months later, first man got saved. And then it took him another five more years for second person to be saved. Then after second person was saved, to have a third person saved, it took him another six years of daily prayer. And then, still, two sons of his friend were not saved. And he, in his own diary, after 36 years later, he wrote this. Two sons of my friend are not yet saved, but I have hope in God. He keeps his promises. And I will continually pray for these two sons. And indeed, God answered his prayers. Year 1897, that was 52 years later, as George Miller prayed for the salvation of five people, the remaining two sons of his friends finally accepted Christ as a Savior. However, George Mueller was already dead at the time. God answered the prayers of dead George Mueller. And this gives us a, such encouragement for us not to ever give up. Whatever desires God has put in, in our life, God answers our prayers even after we die. Last year, my mother passed away. My mother was a woman with a personality that he, she would not owe to anyone, anything. During my childhood, we lived a life of poverty. All my life, uh, before I became adult, that poverty was so comfortable to our family. So my father, because he's a business affair here and there from the relatives, he ended up borrowing money. But this was so burdensome to my mother. So all her life, remaining her life, 
she will, con she will continually save money to pay off all her debts. And I remember vividly the day she paid off all her debts, even the money my father borrowed, and my father passed away much earlier. And she told me, now I'm debt free. I paid all our debts. That's the kind of person my mother was, even before she was a Christian. And then, as she became ill, as she realized her days are not too many days left, knowing her, and I knew she had a last prayer item. One was, she wanted to die during her sleep. That's, that I knew. I knew. She was praying for that. And secondly, even though she didn't tell me, I knew what was a, she was a praying for. She was a praying because she didn't have any money to give us to take care of her funeral. And she knew I was a grace pastor and I don't have any savings account. And, but she didn't want to burden her children after she passed away with the funeral costs and burial costs and all that. And she has been praying for that. So that even after she's gone to be with the Lord, all the funeral and burial costs may be provided by God's grace. And indeed, after she has gone to be with the Lord, during the funeral and after she has gone, we all her children were able to eyewitness faithfulness of God, that God answered her prayer after her death, not only by the grace of God and also your generosity with the church members' condolence and my friends and KM members and all that. Not only we were able to fool it out of funeral and her burial cost, in the honor of my mother's name, we were able to give a large chunk of money as a mission offering. God is a faithful. Whether we are alive or dead, whether we are in the confined situation that our circumstances seem to be dead end, still, God keeps his promise and he's a faithful. And our desire and our prayers can be answered no matter what. If we have given up some prayers because we lost the hope, year 2019 is a closing. We may bury this year, but there's a 20, year 2020. God is still alive, and he's faithful, and he will answer our prayers. One of the burdens and desires that God has put in my heart is tsunami-like revival. And I've been praying for tsunami like a revival. I don't know exactly how it's going to look like. But the reason why I began to pray and talk about it on this podium is about four years ago in my dream, there was an actual tsunami that I saw, never like that large and great, awesome tsunami. And I hope it is a spiritual revival and tsunami like a revival that God will invade upon our church, upon our lives, and upon this nation. But historically, when the revival comes, massive salvation will happen in a short period of time. Thousands and thousands of people will accept Christ as a Savior without too much of human efforts. The entire society will experience transformation. In the history, some Bars were closed down. Some places where prostitutes were prevalent were closed down. And we anticipate the government, the politics, business, and society in holistic way can be transformed. And God has done it multiple times in this story. And we can desire that. And the hearts of the people look from hearts. Those Christians who used to live a compromised life will be sold out for the cause of his kingdom. And repentance will grow around, not only in the individual lives, but in this dead American churches. Compromising American churches may come alive. These are our desires. 
and I cry out to God, God, before you take me home, I want to re-experience a revival in my life. Because at the time that I accepted Christ as a Savior was early 1990s. And our church was experiencing great revival, and we call that Norwalk Revival. Because our church was located, the building was located in the city of Norwalk. And many, many people, when they come to worship, will begin to weep because the presence of God was so strong. And many, many unsaved people will encounter power for God and repent of their sins and will be saved. And I heard from numerous pastors who served in 1980s and 1990s, not only within our church, in America generally, experienced a tremendous revival nationwide. And we desire again for the revival. And I ask God, God, before I die, I want to re-experience this kind of revival but in the end, if God doesn't answer this prayer before I'm taken from EM or I die, it's okay. Even after I die, if church comes back to life, if there's a tsunami like a revival hitting upon this nation and globally, I participated with a prayer and intercession. And according to divine God's timing, God still brings tsunami like a revival. Whatever we pray in the name of Jesus, according to his promise, if you shall ask anything in my name, dead or alive, close or open doors, oppressing circumstance, or even we confront the dead end, God overrides. Every circumstance, his faithfulness endures forever. And God used the dead bones of Elisha to bring a dead man back to life. If he can do that, and his faithfulness endured in such a way, the desire and prayer of Elisha for the double portion will be granted even after he was dead this God, I will put all my trust upon him, no matter what circumstance I may be in. And that is the first lesson we can learn from this story. Second lesson we can learn from this story is whatever seems to be dead in God's economy, in God's kingdom, that's not the end of the story. Seeing a dead person is not good. It's a sad. Something that becomes dead, gives us a discouragement. However, in God's kingdom, deadness is not always, all the time, bad. Because deadness brings life quite often. The best example we know is Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. And he was mocked. He was persecuted. He was naked. He was humiliated before Awful sinners who was a sinless, who was a righteous king, who was the creator. But because of his death, we have received eternal life. Elisha's dead bone gave life to another man. So in our life, something that is dead, seemingly in the eyes of people, may be bad. But that's not the end of the story. Because the deadness can easily give life to other people. When husbands die to their egos, wives will come alive and children will live happy life. When a pastor dies to his ego, the flock of God may come alive. In a community, when a brother or sister dies to his opinion, his preferences, his ideas, then the Unity will experience unity. And when there is a unity, there's a revival. When there is a unity, power of the Holy Spirit will be exerted. Death brings life. And only when we die, we will be able to experience power of 
resurrection. Often, we must die first in order for us to experience the spiritual resurrection in our life. And the Bible is full of such stories. Moses, God would allow him to dead, to be dead in the wilderness for 40 years. He grew up in the palace with the best education, with the best intelligence, with the best lifestyle. But with a such person, God cannot use, but God will allow him to die to his ego, die to his pride, die to his own ways during 40 years of wilderness. And when he was completely dead, God will call him from burning bush. And that's how God does. And when something is dead in our own eyes, that doesn't mean it's completely dead. God is still at work. Jonah, because of his disobedience, he was thrown into the ocean and large fish swallowed him up. And he was dead. Practically, he was dead inside a womb of the large fish. Everywhere he sees full darkness. It was dead. It was stinking. Every corner he turns is a blackish wall, wall after wall. He was dead. However, God was still at work. Even in own, his own eyes, in his own circumstances, Everything seemed to be black, peach, darkness, and death. But God was moving that large fish to the exact location and destiny that God desired Jonah to be. And then when due time came, he was vomited out. And with his powerful resurrection message, the entire Nineveh repented before God, and that city was saved. And that's the work of God. We must die to ourselves. We must die to our ego. We must die to ourselves. We must die to our opinions. We must die to our desires. We must die to our preferences. And then it gives a life. Not only back to us as a life, but more abundantly, multiplied, and more powerfully. Do you know even in our physical world, there are something dead that gives us life? Vegetables, when you eat them, are they alive? No. We eat dead vegetables. We eat dead meat. But they give us nutrition. They give us energy. They give us health. When ladies love flowers, you put flowers in the vase. Are they alive? No, they're dead but they give you beauty of life. During the Christmas season, if you buy a tree, Christmas tree, are they alive? No, they're dead. You put it in the living room. It gives a celebration to your life. There are many things seemingly dead, but they give us life. Dead Elisa's bones gave life. To another man. When we are dead to ourselves, to our dream, God gives us resurrected life. Third lesson we can learn from this story is as we conclude the year 2019 and approach 2020, if we want to experience a resurrection, if we want to experience a life, life abundantly, before we close the year 2019, we need to die to something. We need to die to our habits. We need to die to the lust of our flesh. We need to die to ambitions of this world. Otherwise, even year 2020, we may not be able to experience full life. If some of us in year 2019, if we didn't experience a full life, abundant life, multiply the fruits, in our life, perhaps, because you are unwilling to die to some of the habits and some of the life pattern that you compromise before God and still hoped for life in your life, it doesn't work like that. 
Jesus even said in the book of John, chapter 12, verse 24, he said, he said, <laughs> Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Some of us, in the year 2019, if our life was a scarce, if our life was a fruitless, if our life didn't experience a power, perhaps you didn't die to certain things so you ought to die. Maybe certain habits you enjoy, certain pleasures, certain worldly entertainments, you linger and continually leave a door open for Satan to come to kill, to destroy, and to steal. But as we conclude the year 2019, if you desire life in year 2020, before we close this year, we must die to old habits. We must die to worldly ambition. We must die to certain things. We must die to complain. We must die to ambition. We must die to computer games. One example. Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Book of Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. This man, amazing man of God, the word was crucified unto him, and he was crucified unto the word. Any ambition, any entertainment, pleasures, lust, temptations, he was fully crucified to the word. So that's why in the book of Colossians chapter 3 verse 1, he was able to encourage us with that. If then you are raised with Christ, because we were crucified with Christ on that cross, we were crucified with the pleasures of this world, lust of this world, ambitions of this world, worldly ways. And then we were raised with the Christ. Then seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. To be able to recognize if I still dwell in the things that are dead. Many of us are bound by the habits, things we do, which are, in fact, dead. They're so temporal. They're dead, but we linger into them. To recognize what they are, let me give you three diagnoses. The things that I do, is it motivated because I love God? Everything I do should be motivated by the love of God. I do this because I love God. Things, habits I do, the compromise and life parents that I do, are they motivated because of love of God? Do I do them because I love God? That's the first question. Secondly, things I do, are they pleasing to God? Is this something that God is pleased with? The things I say, are they pleasing to God? Things I do, are they pleasing to God? That's the second question. Third question. Is it something that I expect reward from heaven? Whatever I say, whatever I do, am I anticipating heavenly reward out of all these? When you ask three things, and the answers to three questions. Am I doing this because I love God? Is it pleasing to God? Is it something that I can anticipate, heavenly reward? Most likely, if you cannot say yes to them, are something you can crucify. 
dear beloved saints. We are closing year 2019, but the heaven's door is not closed. God's ears are not still closed. His ears are widely open because of Jesus Christ. Hope that we lost, enthusiasm that we lost, passion that we have lost, we can pick them up again. If God can answer the prayer of Eliza after he passed away, God can grant our desires and answer our prayers, overriding every closed circumstance. If our hearts are like a dead bone, let's bring the cross to our heart and let it be rekindled and revived. And something in our life might be dead already. Some circumstance, some desire, some plan may have been dead. But because they are dead, especially my ego and my pride, I can anticipate greater life in the year 2020. And lastly, what are some things you need to death to? What are some things that you linger in your life, unwilling to crucify them so that you don't expect full, abundant life? Let them be dead. Let's die to them. Let's kill them. Whether it's a bad habit, whether it's vain ambition, or whatever behavior or lifestyle, compromise it may be, let's kill them so that we may be able to fully enjoy abundant, fruitful, multiplied life in the year 2020. Let us arise. Can we think about two things as we worship the Lord? One is, what have I given up? What hope have I given up? What prayer items that I've lost? What godly desire that has been squashed? Can we pick them up again? God used the dead bones to give dead people life. That rugged wooden cross gave us eternal life. God fulfilled the desire of dead men. God answered prayers of the people even after they're gone. Our God is a faithful. Even though we are unfaithful, even though we fail Him so many times, even though we disobey Him and rebel against Him, even though we are full of shortcomings, his faithfulness is unconditional. His faithfulness is not confined by our circumstances and by how we behave. Once He speaks, He fulfills. Once He makes a promise, He always keeps. He is such a good God. And He loves you and he loves you and he cares for you and he answers your cries and he is always beside you every single man in this world will fail you I guarantee you every single person in your life will betray you 
will fail you, will disappoint you. Anyone, anything you try to grasp, that will flee away from you. Accept Lord Jesus Christ. Accept your God. He will never forsake you. He will never disown you. He will never disappoint you. His faithfulness endures forever. 